That's what God wants us to be here in Memphis, Tennessee. We need to be a catalyst for spiritual awakening, and we do that by loving Jesus Christ. Baptist Church this morning. Let's all stand together. Praise the Lord together. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from Oh, He is my song Let the King of my heart be the shout
such a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Turn to somebody close to you and say, Jesus Christ is my living hope. Let's remain standing and just, just remain in this a- attitude of, uh, of praise and celebration. We're going to celebrate as a friend of ours up here is following the Lord in believer's baptism. So let's turn our attention to the baptistry. Thank you, Brother Steve. I am here in the baptistry this morning with Silvana Ordez. And Silvana, yay! We've got a cheering section out there, Silvana. Very good. She's full of the joy of the Lord. She's a happy young lady. She has repented of her sins, believes that Jesus died and rose from the dead to save her, and has received Jesus into her life as her Lord and Savior. In fact, she did that at Camp Outrageous uh, two years ago. So she's come this morning to follow the Lord now in believer's baptism. And Silvana, it's my great joy to baptize you, my little sister. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried with Jesus in baptism into death, and we are raised to walk in newness of life. God bless you, Savannah. You love the Lord and serve Him. And all God's people rejoiced and said, Brandy and I did not know the Lord when we were dating. Uh, We met in a very broken situation on both sides. I was raised in religion, but not relationship. I was not anti-God, I just didn't think that he liked me very much. I lost my mom to breast cancer when I was eight. About a month after my mom and dad said that they were separating, my mom came to where I worked and said that my dad had killed himself. And um, from then on, my life just began a downward spiral. And that's when I met Shelton. We met and then my father uh, died in a fatal car wreck on Father's Day weekend. We just wanted to move and start over. But there was always this emptiness between both of us. I had given up on the idea of ever being happy in my marriage. And so I went and I filed for divorce. She started to go to church and it kind of made me mad because I was like, no, we're at war. You're not going to go find Jesus right now. Shelton came back and he said, I want to work on this. And so we decided to get back together. We started um, attending the church. That was just when the Lord spoke to me and I just knew that I needed Jesus. I didn't want religion. Brandy hears the gospel of grace and love and mercy, and I'm still counting the cost of all the rules and the things I can and cannot do. She was gonna do it with or without me. That was when we made a decision to accept Christ, and that was when the new chapter kind of began. And soon as I was baptized, um, I think spiritual warfare became even more prominent. I had tried so long to just modify my behavior or to resist those sins, but I had never replaced it with a relationship with Christ. And I remember sitting down at lunch with my first life group teacher and he was like, man, I'm not here to go over it. Why can't I do this and why can't I do that? He goes, but I can promise you one thing. If you will fill yourself up with the truth, the less and less you want in the world. And so through my personal relationship with the Lord as it grew is where I began to recognize what that spiritual warfare kind of looked like. Even being so young in our faith, the Lord was bringing people alongside us that we could encourage at the same time. A couple years ago, I felt that I was called to ministry. I'm in Joshua. We get to the part where the Israelites are um, at the Jordan and they're kind of comfortable on the banks of the Jordan. You know, and I was in my own life, I'm like, well, I'm kind of comfortable on these banks. He revealed to me that my Jordan was my decision to relinquish my corporate job. We don't know where we're going, but we do know that we are sent. I can promise you that if he can take a mess like we had and make it his message, no matter what your problem is, God is good. And now the enemy is gonna come at you and you are signing up for battle. And I think just through that trust and through that obedience and through that discipline of getting the Lord better, 
um, we had the unique opportunity to become a new creation. I love it when he said, if, if the Lord can take a mess like me and fix that, he can fix you. And we're grateful for that today. Let's pray for our offering and we'll continue to worship the Lord. Thank you, Father, for this beautiful testimony, this Jesus story, that Jesus, Lord, literally changed their lives. I pray, dear God, that you'd bless this offering so that we can have ministries, dear God, that reach out to people that minister the love of Jesus. Bless this offering. Bless our worship. Bless the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
I was talking to a guy one time, and he came to Jesus. He got saved. In a few weeks, he came to me and said, hey, Steve, why is it so hard? I said, what's so hard? He said, why is it so hard to live for the Lord? <clears throat> How many of you know that it's hard to live for the Lord? Amen. Do you know why? You have an enemy. We don't talk much about it, but you're in a war. He said, I'm not in a war. Yes, you are. The minute you got saved, you joined an army. And you're in a battle. Your enemy is the devil, and he is real. He's not like Hollywood says he is. He appears like an angel of light. You know, in Hollywood, the devil looks really mean and bad, and he is really mean and he is really bad, but he doesn't show him that, that way, himself that way much. He, he always comes in an alluring way. He knows what your weaknesses are, not because he's omniscient, but because he's been studying you and his demons have been studying you. This whole world, since we fell into sin, is a battlefield. Unseen spirits are at war with one another. I'm really grateful that God does not allow us to see the angels and the demons fighting. It would scare us big time. But it's going on around us all the time. Demonic spirits, where did they come from? Where did the devil come from? The devil was an angel worshiped God, got the big head, decided he would usurp the authority of God. Bad idea. And a third of the angels followed him, and he was kicked out of heaven to this earth, and they became fallen angels or demons. Jesus rebuked them. Paul rebuked them. Peter rebuked them. And they have not gone away just because it's no longer the first century. There are demonic spirits, Daniel said, that are over entire countries. There are angelic beings, good ones that rule over countries on behalf of the Lord. And there's a war going on all the time. And if you are not focused, if you're not in the game, if you're not in the fray, if you're not constantly in the battle. The devil is smarter than you. He is stronger than you. He is slyer than you. He is shiftier than you. He can outsmart you. He can outthink you. The only hope you have is to stay in love with Jesus Christ and to pursue Jesus, to live in the Word of God, because the devil is going to bombard you with thoughts of fear, anger, discouragement, lust, control, jealousy. How many of you know the kind of thoughts I'm talking about? Anybody out there? Your mind is the battlefield, and he will constantly bombard you. That's why you have to live in the Word of God. A day without the Bible what are you talking about? I may miss a lot of things. I'm not going to miss the Word, man. i got to have some Word every day. I'm hooked on Scripture, and I need an IV. Amen. I mean, I need it in my body. I need it in my mind. I read it out loud because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I read it slow because I'm not that sharp to begin with, and I, I just keep on reading it just as much as I would feed on food, I feed on the bread of the Word of God. I feed on the living water of the Word of God. you got to live in Scripture. Just because you've been saved doesn't mean you're free. You're forgiven, but you're still in a battle. And some people, in fact, many Christians have 
simple strongholds. Dr. Rogers was the pastor before me. He preached a sermon. They put it into a little booklet. You need this booklet. I don't make any money off of his books. This book, How to Break Satan's Strongholds in Your Life, listen to how he starts off. He was pastor here 32 years before me. People have all kinds of strongholds in their lives. I believe strongly that there are some people reading this booklet who have allowed Satan to build strongholds in their hearts, their minds, and their lives. Not only are these satanic strongholds harmful, harming them and wrecking their spiritual lives, but through them they're contaminating the lives of their families and their churches, all because the devil has found an unclean place, a spot of ground, if you will, in the person's heart and has built a stronghold there. He then uses it to war against God and against the work of God. That whole concept is this. You're saved. You're, you love the Lord. Your name's in the book of life. But you give in to some sin. And you don't repent of it. And you don't turn away from it. And you develop, you give the devil ground. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give him, the Greek word is topos, topography. Don't give him spiritual topography in your life. Don't give him a place where he can set up a tent like a squatter's camp. If you went out in your, if you have a home and you have a yard and you went out there and there was some hobo that had pitched a tent in your front yard the night before, you'd call the police. You'd say, you don't have any right to be here. And guess what? You're right. But he says, well, I'm not leaving until you force me out of here. Well, hello, I'm calling the police. Okay, I guess I'll go. How many of you would do that? You'd call the police and get that guy off your lawn. Some of you wouldn't. Some of you just, you want a hobo on your lawn. <laughs> That'll be great for your lawn. They're going to kick you out of the neighborhood is what they're going to do. You won't have to worry about the hobo. The devil is a hobo if you're a Christian. And he tries to get on your yard. You get in a fuss with your spouse over nothing. And you don't repent. The devil said, ah, foothold. Topos. I'll go there. And you have to repent of that and say, Lord, I'm sorry that I got into it with my spouse. Don't look at me so holy, by the way. <laughs> Any two people getting together, you're going to argue some. Amen belong there. Amen belong there. I don't care if you're a preacher. And so, you say, Lord, I'm sorry. I wasn't loving my wife like Christ loved the church. I'm sorry, Lord, I wasn't submitting to my husband the way I'm supposed to. Please forgive me. And I take that ground back. And Satan, I command you in the name of Jesus you have no right to be here. You have to flee. I resist you. You have to flee. And he does. I've done that thousands of times because I don't want to give the devil a foothold in my life. More about that at the end of the sermon. But just because you're saved, just because you're on your way to heaven, doesn't mean you're walking in freedom, doesn't mean you're walking in victory, doesn't mean you've got the victory. This sermon today is in this context, this whole series on live like it matters. Your life matters. Your life matters. God has given you life, and in Jesus, He's given you eternal life. The devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. If you're thinking right now that your life is not worth living, that is a lie of the devil, and the only way you fight a lie is with the truth of the Word of God. It is not like Hollywood says with some woman spitting out green slime if she's possessed of the devil. The way you get rid of the devil is the name of Jesus, the Spirit of God, and the Word of God, and the blood of Christ, and the whole armor of God. More about that in a minute. But you got to start walking this way and living this way 
if you're going to walk in victory. And look at me, dark, it's going to get darker before it gets light. It's going to get darker as we come to the end of time. It's going to get more spiritually dark, but the light shines brightest in the darkest darkness. Amen? So the light is going to get brighter. We're going to get brighter. God's going to thin out some of these churches that aren't really churches. They're just, they're just kind of religious country clubs where you're not getting the Word of God. You're just getting a bunch of feel-good stuff. Oh, just come on in. Just come on in. And come as you are and leave as you came. We're not going to say anything that would disturb you. Oh, if you're living in that sin, God understands. Oh, if you're doing that, God understands. That's a lie. Yeah, God understands, and He understands you need to repent. And He understands that you got a bad attitude. Anybody told you that lately? God can tell you that. God wants to give you victory. There are demons, there are angels. There is God, there is the devil. The devil is subservient to God. This is not dualism, but God is allowing this war to go on. Jesus has already won the victory through His death on the cross. He crushed the head of Satan who has crushed his heel. Satan crushed Jesus' heel, but Jesus rose from the dead, and Jesus crushed his head. How many of you know that when you get your heel crushed, you can survive that, but when you get your head crushed, it's over, amen? So the devil is a mortally wounded, wild, demonic animal, and he's seeking to, he knows he's bound to hell. I just want to say this to you. If you're a Satanist here today and you've come to Bellevue, if you're into witchcraft or Satanism or voodooism or Wiccanism or any other ism that's going to become a wasm, <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you're serving a loser. You're serving a loser. Jesus Christ is Lord over the devil, and the devil knows it, and he's going to take as many people to hell with him as he can. But he's not going to take you, and he's not going to take me. You know why? We're going to learn to fight. You're in a battle. You need to learn how to fight. And the reason some of you are just getting the tar beat out of you is because you don't know how to fight. How many of you want to know how to fight a spiritual battle? Amen? It's not like your regular battle. We're against a wild spiritual animal. Revelation 12, 9, the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan. He deceives the whole world. He's thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Oh, but listen to me. We've got all we need to fight the devil. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle, underline, highlight chapter, or verse 12 in chapter 6 of Ephesians, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able, you will be able, everybody say, I will be able, to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, I don't have time 
in a 35, 40-minute sermon to give you everything there is about spiritual warfare. But I'm going to give you, I'm going to break down this text. I'm going to give you a lot of information very quickly. And I want, I want to encourage you to really listen, to really focus in. And I'm going to do the best I can in this short amount of time. Number one, let's look there at the authority that we have. Verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might, put on the full armor of God. Be strong in the Lord. The Lord is where our authority comes from. Now, what's the difference between authority and power? How many of you know the difference? Does anybody know the difference? Here it is. Power is your ability to do something. Authority is something that has been invested in you where you're representing somebody else. Let me give you an example that will explain the whole thing. A policeman that does not have his uniform on, does not have his badge, does not have his hat, does not have his gun, does not have his handcuffs. If he walks out here, he doesn't have his whistle, he just stands in front of a moving car and does this, he's liable to get killed. Amen? People don't stop for people like that unless they're just trying to avoid it. You can't physically stop a car because you're strong, all right? Because you've got the power to stop a car. No, you don't have a you don't have enough power. That car will run over you. But you put on a uniform. You put on a hat. You put on a badge. You have a 44 on your hip, and you have a big old whistle, and you say, stop. Every car in Memphis has got any sense going to stop. You know why? But not because you're powerful, but because you're authorized by a higher, higher power. You're authorized by the government to stop a car if you need to. That's the way you are with the devil. You don't have any strength. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And Jesus Christ has authorized you. And in the authority of Jesus, you have the authority to look at the devil and say, not anymore. I'm not going to live like this anymore. I'm not going to live in fear anymore. I'm not going to live in anger anymore. I'm not going to live in lust anymore. I'm not going to be a glutton anymore. I'm not going to be proud anymore. I'm not going to live in sin anymore. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, in the authority of the name of Jesus. I will be strong, not in myself. I will be strong in the authority of the Lord. I will be strong in the Lord, in the strength of His might, in the full armor of God. The Paul, the Apostle Paul, when he got ready to uh, deal with the demon, how did he do it? By the way, what did Jesus say? In Luke 10, verse 19, he said, Behold, I've given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions. That's not talking about those little bugs. He's talking about demons. And over all the power of the enemy, there it is, and nothing will injure you. Paul is in Philippi. He's preaching, and this woman starts wearing him out. What she was saying was good, but she was saying it at the wrong time. Look at me. God never interrupts himself. If God is speaking, like right now, I'm preaching the Word of God. God is speaking through me. I'm not trying to, you know, be the, the, you know, big, bad, and whatever. I'm just saying God's speaking through me. So if somebody stood up right now and started prophesying whether it'd be out of order. You know why? God doesn't interrupt Himself. God doesn't talk through two people at one time. So I would lovingly say to them, I love you. God bless you. Sit down. And so here you've got this woman interrupting and Paul knew where the source of it was. It happened that as we were going to the place of prayer, and watch this, a slave girl with a spirit of divination, a Numa python, a spirit of python, met us. That where were they going to, what were they going to do? What were they going to do? Pray. Doesn't the devil fight you when you pray? When you're going to pray? Phone starts ringing, people get mad, everything else. You know, you stump your toe in the middle of the dark, whatever. You're going to pray. Spiritual activity begets spiritual activity. When you start to pray, the devil will come after you. 
They're going to pray, and this woman with the spirit of Python met us who was bringing her master as much profit by fortune telling. By the way, don't go to a fortune teller. They're either fake or if they're real, they're demonized. Stay away from that stuff. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out saying, these men are bondservants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Nothing wrong with the content, but she said over it. It'd be like me preaching and somebody standing up in the balcony and saying, just quoting John 3, 16 the whole time I'm saying it. I'm going to say it. With all due respect, the content's good. The timing's bad. That's not of God. This woman's not of God. She's interrupting the Lord and His message. She continued doing this for many days. And Paul was like Popeye. He has had, had all he could stand. He couldn't stand no more. He was greatly annoyed. He turned and said to the Spirit. He talked to the Spirit. He talked to the demon, not to the woman. He talked to the demon. I command you. In the name of Jesus Christ, there's his authority to come out of her. And can I just make a statement that the demon had no option? It came out at that very moment. That's the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, well, good for Paul. No, 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 no. You got the same Jesus Paul had. You've got the same authority he had. You have been authorized. You're like Barney Fife. You got a bullet. You got a badge, baby. You've got the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. You got the same name of Jesus Paul had, same blood of Jesus Paul had, same Spirit of God Paul had, same Word of God Paul had. In fact, you got more. You got the whole old, the whole New Testament. You've got the Holy Spirit, and you stand in that authority. And you take authority over it. By the way, I believe that there are certain positions that are authorized by God. Parents are authorized as an authority. And you parents that let your children talk smack to you, you're teaching them to be a rebel. And you know who a rebel is? That's demonic. The devils are rebels. When you let your children talk smack to you, You're letting them act like the devil. You're letting the devil overrule your authority in those children's lives. Don't do it. Don't allow it. You moms and dads, you are the authority in your home. You pray over that home. Well, my child won't let me in the room. What are you talking about? (laughs) Tear the door down. Your child doesn't have a room. Your child doesn't pay for anything. It's your air. How many of you pay for the air conditioning? I I do. That's my air. They breathe my air. They're going to do what I say. Amen? Can't get in their room. I'll get in their room. I'll get in their business. Amen? Not because I'm mean, but I'm not going to let the devil... I decided that long, I'm not letting the devil take my family. I'm not letting the devil take my marriage. I'm not letting the devil take my kids. No way. No way. And you don't need to be talking about people in political office. You don't need to be bad-mouthing the president. Well, I didn't vote for him, and he's this and he's that. I'm going to tell you something. You're calling down wrath upon yourself when you do that kind of stuff. You just need to close your mouth and pray for those people that are in office. That's what the Bible says. You don't need to run your mouth. You need to respect the office. Well, I didn't vote for him. Doesn't matter. Not as many amens on that, is it? I don't preach for amens from you. I preach for amens from there. Amen. That's the authority we have. Now, the enemy we face. How many of you know we got an enemy out there? The devil's real. Put on the full armor of God, verse 11, so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. God has a plan for your life. The devil has a scheme for your life. He's going to try to take you down. And look at me. He can if you let him, but only if you let him. For our struggle, how many of you know that the Christian life is a struggle? Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. People are not your problem. Look at your neighbor and say, you are not my problem. (laughs) 
Now, that's enough. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. These are demonic spirits. The powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. There is an army out there of demons that are attacking the people of God. Fallen angels, demonic spirits, spiritual darkness, it is real. I want you to go home and read Mark chapter 5, Jesus is in a boat. He has just calmed the sea. His disciples are with him. He gets to the eastern shore. He comes to a graveyard. A naked man starts running out of the graveyard with chains on his wrist that he's broken, and he's running at Jesus, and the disciples don't get out of the boat. They, I can hear them saying, Jesus, this one's for you. Go get him, Jesus. We're behind you, praying for you, Jesus. And the man falls down at his feet. He's demonized. Please don't cast us out. Please don't cast us out. Jesus said, what is your name? Legion, for we are many. What does legion tell you? Well, there were a lot of them. So there's a lot of demons. There were a lot of demons just in this one man. Enough that when Jesus cast them out, 2,000 swine went into the Sea of God. There were at least 2,000 demons in this man. Legion is 6,000. So if that, if but I don't trust the devil to tell the truth, so I don't know how many there were. I know there are at least 2,000, all right, because of how many pigs got killed. And now, not only are they multiple, but they are organized. They're in an army. That means they're taking orders, and they've got a plan. They've got a strategy, and they are vicious. If you want to see what the devil wants, go read Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Here's a man that is naked. Here's a man that is cutting himself, gashing himself with rocks. Where do you think that comes from nowadays? All these people cutting themselves, abusing themselves, all this abusive sex and everything, it is not of God, it is of the devil. It is of the devil. And I'm telling you, God doesn't want you to abuse yourself. God doesn't want you to kill yourself. God doesn't want that. Any thought of suicide, any thought of that kind of thing is straight from the devil. And praise God, you have, if you're a Christian, you can have victory over the enemy. You don't have to listen to that stuff, but you have to silence it. I'm going to tell you how. Jesus cast the demons out, and the man, the Bible says, after Jesus got through with him, was sitting at his feet. He was calm. He was clothed. He was in his right mind. Man, that's what you are when Jesus sets you free from demonic strongholds. You are calm. You're sitting at the feet of Jesus. You're not running all over the place. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? No, no, no. You're calm. Jesus has straightened you out. You're calm. You're just sitting. And now you're clothed. You're no longer naked. And who was it that clothed him? Not the disciples. They're back in the boat. Jesus took his own coat off and put it on this man. And he's collected. He's in his right mind. Wow. Calm clothed and collected. That's what you are when you're following Jesus. Isn't that better than running around naked with chains, screaming and cutting yourself up? The devil wants you to destroy your own life. He wants you to hate yourself, but God wants you to love him as you love yourself. God wants to forgive you God wants to be gracious to you. God wants to take you where you are, pull you out of the miry clay, put your feet on a rock, and take you where you need to go. God is a forgiving God. God is a protective God. God can handle legion. James 4, verses 7 through 8, write that down. It's one of the key verses on spiritual warfare. Let's all read it together. 
Read it with me, good and strong. Here we go. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. He will draw near to you. There are three verbs there. Keep it on the screen. Submit, resist, draw near. Say it with me. Submit, resist, draw near. Say it again. Submit, resist, draw near. How do you do that? Well, first of all, you submit. Pretty good, right? Know what it says? God, I submit my life to you. I'm a Christian. I give you my life. I offer myself up as a living and holy sacrifice. Whatever you want in my life, that's fine with me. I totally submit to the will of God. Resist. Now, what I do is I usually pray uh, with my head bowed, or I might be on my knees. This morning I was on my knees. Sometimes I'm on the treadmill, but I, it doesn't matter where you are. In my heart, I'm submitting, I'm bowing. But then when I talk to the devil, and I do talk to the devil every day, just about that much, every day. Some of y'all, really, I wish you could see how you're looking at me right now. I talk to the devil about that much every day. But I do. I talk to him every day. I submit to God, and then I resist the devil. Now, this is real hard. Okay, listen to this. Here's what I do. I say, devil, I resist you. You got that? That wasn't that hard, was it? Satan, I resist you in the name of Jesus through his shed blood by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. I resist you in every demonic spirit away from me and my family. And I command you to leave any scheme you have against me is crushed in the name of Jesus and you cannot defeat what God wants to do through, through me today. In the name of Jesus, go to the abyss or wherever Jesus would send you. And that's all I say. That's it. He knows he's going to hear the same thing from me every day. And then I just draw near to God again, and he draws near to me. And I finish my prayer time. I pray for about an hour every day. I'm not trying to brag. I'm just telling you where I am right now. I've been doing this for a while. And about 30 seconds, and I don't bow down to the devil I stand straight up, and I talk to him, and I, I don't yell. It's not a shouting match. It's a truth match. And I bring truth from the Word of God to the liar of all liars, and I rebuke him. I resist him. You say, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Well, it's in the Bible. Paul did it. Jesus did it. I don't revile the devil. I don't taunt the devil. That's, we're told not to do that in 2 Peter and Jude, but those people that did that, they were lost people anyway. I'm not going to taunt the devil. I'm not going to say, come on, devil, give it your best shot. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to get it. I don't go looking for this stuff. But when it shows up, God's told me what to do, and I know how to deal with it. You need to learn. That's the enemy we face. Number three, the weapons we use. Look at verse 13. Therefore, take up the full armor of God. Everybody say, full armor of God. So that you'll be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. How many of you know we live in an evil day? Does anybody know that? Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows or darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I never was in the military, but I played football. I put on a helmet. I put on shoulder pads. I put on hip pads, I put on knee pads, thigh pads, cleats. I know what it's like to put on that and kind of go to war. I understand that. So for me, this is not that hard. I understand that every day I got to get dressed spiritually. And I don't just dress me. I dress everybody connected me. I dress my wife. I dress my 35-year-old son, his family. I dress my girls, my three daughters and their families, all my grandkids, all my in-laws, I dress all of us. I mean, I, dress, I, there's, I don't know how many, there's a, several dozen people I dress every day. You say, how do you dress them? Here it is. You ready? I do it every day. Father, in the name of Jesus, 
And I, I mention their name by name. I pray for them every name. Father, in the name of Jesus, put on us. Gird our loins with your truth. Shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Put on us the breastplate of righteousness. Put on us the helmet of salvation. Take up the shield of faith. And I, I mean, I do all this. Stuff. I'm, I'm doing, doing it like I do it. I'm, I'm doing it right now. Is that okay? I, Lord, I take up the shield of faith wherewith I will quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. Not some, but all. I take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And right there, I always say, greater is he who's in me than he's in the world. I don't know why that just kind of got in there, and I don't quit saying it. Amen? And then I say, Lord, I will pray at all times with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching there too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And then I pray things like this. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that no weapon formed against us today will prosper. Every tongue that accuses us in judgment today, we will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Our vindication is from you, saith the Lord. No evil will befall us. No plague will come near our dwelling. You will give your angels charge concerning us to guard us in all of our ways. Father, I pray that we won't have car wrecks. I pray that we won't be murdered. I pray that nobody would mug us. Nobody would rape us. Nobody would kidnap us. Nobody would break into our homes. Nobody would break into our identity and steal anything from us. Nobody would break into our cars. Lord, I pray that you would be a shield about us, the glory and the lifter of our head. Father, I thank you that I have the whole armor of God on right now. Do you ever pray like that? Do you ever pray like that? Or is your bunch spiritually naked every day? And you wonder why your family's getting the tar beat out of you. You're not dressed. Can you imagine? Go home and watch a football game this afternoon. Can you imagine a pro football player running out on the field just in some shorts and a t-shirt? I'm ready to play. Don't have any cleats. Don't have a helmet. Bring it on. He's going to get killed. Can you imagine a soldier running out into a field with no gun, with no knife, with no bullets, with no helmet, with no nothing, and just running, boo, <laughs> boom. He's knocked out. And you wonder why you're getting killed spiritually. Get the armor of God on and get in the game. Get in the war. The weapons we use. And then fourthly, the prayers we pray. It's all about prayer. You put all this stuff on by prayer. Look at verse 18. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. With this in view, be on the alert. With all perseverance and petition for all saints, pray on my behalf. Pray, 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 pray. You know why I know prayer is important? Because Jesus prayed. Jesus was tempted and Jesus prayed. Look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and there's only three people in the Bible that fasted 40 days and 40 nights. You know who they are? Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And who appeared to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah. The only three people in the Bible that did a 40-day fast. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. He answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. The devil took him into his holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the, word, the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in his glory. And he said to him, all these things I'll give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, he rebukes the devil, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do when the devil came after him? He spoke the Word of God. He was speaking the sword of the Spirit. He was fighting with the whole armor of God like you and I do. He was fasting. He was praying. That's how you fight the devil. That's how you fight the devil. And some of you, I love you, but you're not even in the battle. You're not even in the battle. You don't pray. You pray a little prayer. Lord, bless my day. Bless me as I go to work. Lord, watch over us. Lord, I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. That's, that's not going to cut it. That's not going to cut it. No wonder your marriage is so messed up. No wonder your kids are so messed up. No wonder 
Your thought life's so messed up. You're not praying. I can't do anything for you if you're not going to pray. If you're not going to really get after it in prayer, make it a priority in your life, make it a priority in your marriage. I don't care if you fumble through it and don't know exactly how to do it, it doesn't matter. I'd rather learn to pray by fumbling through it until I got it down than not do it because I don't know how to do it. Believer in Christ, I cannot overemphasize the necessity for prayer if you want victory. The prayers we pray. And then the gospel we share, all of it is so the gospel will go forth. Look at verse 19. Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. No wonder, no wonder Paul led so many people to Christ. He prayed all the time. He prayed. He fought the devil. He bound demons. He he pled the blood of Jesus over the places where he was, and people started getting saved and coming out of bondage because the devil has people blind to the gospel. But when you take authority over all of that and you start walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, God all of a sudden gives you victory. People start getting saved. You start sharing the gospel. People start getting baptized. People come out of every kind of problem you can imagine. Christian, you're in a war. People are not your problem. It's the devil, it's the demons. But you have authority over your enemy. God's given you weapons. He wants you to pray. He wants you to share the gospel. About 20 years ago, 20, 22 years ago, I was pastor of a great church growing, budget going up, buildings going up, baptisms going up, all the B's. And I was ready to quit. I was empty on the inside. And I came to Donna and I said, baby, I'm working harder than I've ever worked, but I'm more empty than I've ever been in my life. And if this is all there is to ministry, because I had a great ministry. My ministry was growing, all that stuff. People were driving in, joining the church and all that stuff. But I was empty on the inside. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Success in life, failure in your heart. And I went to the Lord and I started pleading with the Lord. I said, Lord, what? is going on and very gently he just began to peel back my eyes and said look at your prayer life and it was basically not there I was going through the motions I'd learned how to preach in seminary I'm not saying I was a complete hypocrite but I wasn't talking with the Lord And God sent me on a journey. And I looked at all the junk in my life that had been in my life, all was in my family. You know, sometimes <laughs> I get tickled. People say, oh, I can't wait to see my family in heaven. You didn't like them while they were on earth. <laughs> What's the difference? You had all these arguments going on all the time, all this sin in your life and everything. Somebody needs to do something about that. So I said, Lord, whatever was passed on to me from Edgar and Dorothy, I'm not passing it on to my bunch. I'm not saying my kids are perfect. They're not. But I drew a line in the sand, literally. And I said, it ends with me. I went on a long fast. I started praying Scripture. I started praying with my little scripture cards. I started really getting after it, praying in the name of Jesus, putting on the whole armor of God, praying over my marriage, praying with my wife. And I can't tell you what the last 
20 years have meant to me, 22 years. I'll be frank with you. No lie. I have no idea how many people we run in Sunday school or worship. People ask me all the time. I say, I don't know. There's a lot of people there is all I know. I don't care the number. I just want to walk with the Lord. I'm not here for numbers. You know, men can get caught up with numbers real quick. So I don't get into all that. I, w- I, don't, even, I, I don't know all that stuff. But I'm walking. I want, I want to look at I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not perfect. I'm telling you, though, I'm pushing into Jesus harder than I ever have in my life. And I'm having more victory. I'm seeing more prayers answered than I ever have in my whole life. And it's all because one day I just figured out, man, I'm in a battle. (laughs) And I don't want to, I don't want my family to lose. How many of you don't want to lose? Anybody out there? Amen. 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 I'm going to leave you revved up. I read this a long time ago. This fires me up. You can stay calm if you want to. I'm going to get happy, all right? I'm not telling you how to act, but you listen to this. It's called I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier in the army of my God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my commanding officer. The Holy Scripture is my code of conduct. Faith, prayer, and the Word of God are my weapons of warfare. I've been taught by the Holy Spirit, trained by experience, tried by adversary, adversity, and tested by fire. I am a soldier. I am a volunteer in this army. I'm enlisted for eternity. I will not get out. I will not sell out. I will not be talked out. I will not be pushed out. I am faithful. I am reliable. I am capable in Christ. I am dependable. I am If my God needs me, I'm showing up. I'm going to be all there. I'm a soldier. I'm not a baby. I don't need to be pampered. I don't need to be petted. I don't need to be primped up, pumped up, picked up, pepped up. I am a soldier. No one has to call me to remind me. Nobody has to write me or visit me or entice me or lure me. I am a soldier. I know when to show up. I am not a wimp. I am in my place. I am on time. I'm saluting my king. I'm obeying his orders. I'm praising his name, building his kingdom. No one has to send me flowers. Nobody has to send me a gift. Nobody has to put my name in the bulletin. I don't have to be sent food, cards, candy, and I don't even need a handout because I am a soldier. I don't have to be cuddled. I don't have to be cradled. I don't have to be cared for. I don't have to be catered to. I am completely committed no matter what because I am a soldier. I I cannot have my feelings hurt bad enough to turn me around. I cannot get discouraged enough to make me turn aside. I cannot lose enough to make me quit. When Jesus called me into this army, I had nothing. So if I end up with nothing, I'm going to come out ahead because I've still got Jesus. I win because Jesus has already won. He has defeated death hell and the grave. My God supplies all of my needs. I'm more than a conqueror. I am living in triumph. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am a soldier. The devil cannot defeat me. People cannot delusion, disillusion me. Weather cannot weary me. Sickness cannot stop me. Battles cannot beat me. Money cannot buy me. Governments cannot silence me. And hell cannot handle me. I am a soldier. Even death cannot destroy me. One day my commander calls will call me from the battlefield and will promote me to heaven and I'll be a captain. He will allow me to rule and reign with him forever. Until then, I'm a soldier in his army. I'm marching forward. I'm claiming victory. I won't give up. I won't shut up. I won't bend. I won't bow. I won't burn. I will not turn around. I'm marching. I'm heaven bound. Here I stand. Will you stand with me? Will you stand with me? How many of you are a soldier out there? Anybody? You want to be a soldier for God. Amen. Amen. It's time for the church of God to rise up. It's not a Republican church. It's not a Democratic church. It's not a black church. It's not a white church. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood-bought Spirit-filled, 
Jesus-honoring church. And we're not going to take the devil's stuff. Our kids are not going down over our praying bodies, over our fasting bodies, over our souls that are clothed in the whole armor of God bodies. We're going to walk in faith. We're going to walk in victory. We're not going to give in. If we get hit, if we sin, we're going to confess it, take that ground back and walk in the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of God and the name of Jesus and we're going to plead the blood and we're going to walk in prayer and when we don't understand things and when we go through hard times, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil for we know that our God is with us whether we feel Him or not. And we're not going to flit around from this church to that church to over there and who's got the coolest band and who's got the coolest preacher and who's got the coolest, you know, whatever suppers or whatever it is they're handing out, doling out free. Who cares about all that stuff? I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to commit to the church. I'm going to commit to my brothers and sisters in Christ. And even if I don't know you, if you're my brother and sister in Christ, I am your brother and sister. I'm not a sister, by the way. I'm a brother in Christ. (laughs) Pulled out of that one pretty quick, didn't I? Yeah, all right. I'm not confused about that. Don't worry about that. (laughs) But I am your pastor, but I am also your brother in Christ. And we're going to walk together, and we're going to see God do great things in this city. If somebody gets wounded, we're not going to shoot them. We're going to pick them up, help them out, dust them off, and build them up, and get them going again. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Help me, Lord. See, for y'all, this is a sermon. For, this, for me, this is my life. That's where I got some victory right there, buddy. Y'all come on up here and start singing, or I'll, I'll stay all day. Amen. <laughs> if you don't know the Lord, I, I don't know what to say. If you don't know the Lord, bless your heart. Get saved, man. It's the best thing going. You say, I'm too much of a mess. No, don't say that. Jesus died for you, shed his blood for you, gave his all for you, and Jesus' all is better and bigger than your mess up, all right? Jesus can cleanse you from anything, forgive you from anything. Every sin in the book has been committed by the people in this room. You say, oh, they look so holy. (laughs) None of us are. How many of you know it's all by the grace of God? Amen? All by the grace of God. Amen. That's all we got. That's all we got. So, if you don't know the Lord, pastors, come on down. And let's be standing right here at these aisles, and they'll be ready to receive you. If you want to come and just give your heart to the Lord and repent of your sins and get going in the right direction, God will forgive you. You come. They'll take the Bible and show you how to be saved. If you've already been saved, you need to be baptized. It's the very first thing you do when you get saved. Come and set up a time to do that. Don't be ashamed. If you want to join this church, and I look, I realize a lot of people probably don't want to join this church because they do want to come as they are and leave as they came, and they want a little feel-good 20-minute sermon. Hey, I got new. That ain't going to happen here, all right? Not just the 20 minute sermon. But we're here to study the Word of God. This is the only time most of us get together all together all week long. And we're going to do business. We're not going to play around. We're not going to cuddle you and cradle you. We're, I'm not going to beat you up, but I'm going to give you the Word. It may not always look pretty, it may not always be perfect little outline. I'm going to give you the word that God has given me during the week. You're going to get it. It's not going to be something I got from somebody else off the internet. It's not going to be a cut and paste job. It's going to be straight out of the Bible, through my heart, through my mouth, to your heart. If you want to be in that kind of church, we'd love to have you. We'd love to have you. We have people driving 50, 60 miles to come to this church. Come on, I'd rather drive 50 miles and get fed than walk across the street and get fooled. Amen? So if, if this is where God's feeding you, this is where He's leading you. Come on.
Just come on and join. Amen? And I'm not putting down any other church. I'm not putting, God knows my heart. I'm not putting down any other church. But if this is where God's feeding you, this is where He's leading you. So you come on and join today. Up in the balcony, all you folks on this side over here, you go to that banner that says Savior. All the, on this side, you go to that banner that says Way. All you right here, you'll come right down here. And ladies, we know you want to talk with a lady. These men will put you with the lady. We'll be about five, maybe ten minutes. Be the best five, ten minutes you spend all week long. 168 hours in a week, can you give God five or ten minutes talking about your soul? Okay? Lord God, thank you that Jesus is Lord over this service. Bless these sweet people. Let Christians get free. Let lost people get forgiven. And bless this time. Let us worship you in spirit and in truth. And we thank you that the only spirit that will operate in this room will be the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. For your glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's sing it out. I cast my mind to Calvary. To Calvary. Where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that curse.
How many of you going to pray this week? Anybody? All right. You pray until you know how to pray. <laughs> People say, how do I learn how to pray? How'd you learn how to walk? Get after it, man. Come on. <laughs> Just pray. Just keep praying. Give us somebody who knows how to pray and pray with them. Then go back and keep praying. Read books, of good, read good, good books on prayer. Listen to sermons on prayer. Learn how to pray. Five o'clock, we're going to have some men. I'm going to be teaching men how to pray over in the chapel this afternoon. And we're going to pray. Call it Delta Prayer Force. If you'd like to come, come on. If you don't want to come, don't come. But you're going to miss a blessing. And uh, I just want to challenge the men. I really feel called to say this to you. Boy, I tell you what, daddies, husbands, boy, you really need to learn how to pray. You really need to get after it. You really do. We have a men's uh, Bible study on Sunday morning. We had over 400 men there this last Sunday, or the last Thursday, Thursday, Thursday morning, 6 o'clock. Eat breakfast. We're studying the book of Samuel. The life of Samuel, rather. You be there this Thursday. We're going to pray and we're going to leave. No announcements, no nothing. Drew's going to lead us in a word of prayer. If you're a guest, thank you for being here. Don and I'd like to meet you back here at Guest Central. We'll give you a gift bag and pray with you. We have church tonight at 6 o'clock pray on Sunday nights, dedicate babies tonight, I'll preach a short sermon, we'll be together, then we'll enter our week having dedicated the week to the Lord by being in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. I want to tell you I love you, and I know I'm talking to somebody right now, the only thing you need is to seek God in prayer. That's what you need, more than you need anything else that you think you need. You don't need a new house. You don't need a new toy, a new car. I'm being as serious as I can about to say, you don't need a new wife. You need to pray. That's where you're missing it, sir. That's where you're missing it. It's not your wife's fault. It's not your job's fault. You're not praying. And everything you need, you'll find in that closet with Jesus. Whoever's got ears to hear, let him hear what the Word of God would say to him today. Drew, come close us out, would you? And you don't have to say anything about that other stuff. Huh? You don't have to say anything about that other stuff. All right. I got that message. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor's going to make his way back, and uh, let's close. Lord, if anyone came here today with the idea of quitting, I pray that they've been encouraged by the Word of God. And Lord, we all received your message today and we bow our hearts now and we pray before you and ask Lord that you strengthen you guide us and that we hear your voice thank you that we were in your house today in Jesus name Amen